Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you again this year, and I'm looking forward to teaching and, and experiencing together the Orthodox liturgical cycle. Let's begin with a prayer. Since last week was Pentecost week, we begin on Pentecost, actually uh, on Pentecost evening, we begin uh, praying the only prayer that is addressed to the Holy Spirit. It's a very special prayer, and most of our services begin with this prayer throughout the year, except for the period right before Pentecost, where we don't say that prayer. Uh, so let's begin with this prayer. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who are in all places and fill all things, treasury of blessings, bountiful giver of life, come and abide in us. Cleanse us of every stain of sin and of your goodness, O Lord, save our souls. Here's the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever unto the ages of ages. It's a great blessing to be with you again. And I know that there are many familiar names from last year and from years before, and also there's some new names. So those of you who are new to the program, welcome. And those of you who are old, older uh, or former members of the program, uh, welcome once again. I look forward to working with you this week. And I look forward to, as I said before, experiencing with you together this beautiful and rich tradition, which is our Orthodox liturgical cycle. So I'm going to do something special today. And for those of you who know me, you probably know that for me, the only way to really understand anything about our uh, theology, about our worship, sorry, is we need to go back to our theology. In other words, everything we do is really theological and especially our liturgical life, what we do in church for me is applied theology. In other words, what we're actually doing in church, that's real dogmatics. It's applied theology. We actually live out what we claim we believe. So for this reason, today I'm gonna to go back to the sort of theological basis of what, uh, how, the liturgical cycle actually begins. And I'm going to be trying to convince you that the whole liturgical cycle begins with something called the Paschal Mystery. What is the Paschal Mystery? You're going to find that in the ancient church, uh, the main uh, days for uh, celebrating the Divine Liturgy were Sundays and Pascha. So there are two major feasts, you might say. Throughout the year, every Sunday, the liturgy was celebrated, and also Pascha. And it turns out that Pascha, in a sense, the meaning of Pascha, and this Paschal mystery that I'm going to try to explain to you today, uh, this uh, was a sort of center from which everything else unfolded. So I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible so you can understand how important this is. So... For me, the best way to explain this is to, is to go back to Scripture. So we're going to start with the meeting of the disciples, the disciples when the disciples met the resurrected Christ on the road to Emmaus. And this will help us understand the Paschal mystery, which begins our whole sort of story of the liturgical cycle of the whole year. So let me share with you. Okay. The road to Emmaus. What are we talking about? In Luke chapter, 20, chapter 24, verses 13 to 31, we have the narration of the events of uh, the meeting of the resurrected Christ on the road to Emmaus. So we need to remember what happened here. The disciples were, were with Christ for three years, at least three years, and they saw him do all the things that he did, all the miracles that he did. He walked on the water. He raised Lazarus. He, he healed the blind. He uh, did so many things. They met the Panagia. The Panagia, I'm sure, had many stories to tell them about uh, Christ and his younger years. In other words, they were with him. They were with the Son of God for three years, and they saw all these things, and yet seems that they didn't really get it. Why? Because he was doing all these godly things, right? Things that you would expect a God to do, but it wasn't good enough. What do I mean? When 
it was time for the crucifixion, what happened? They all ran. In fact, the only people who stayed were women. The women were brave enough because of the duty of love to go back to, first of all, be with Christ uh, at the cross and then to go back afterwards and to find the empty grave. Only in the Gospel of John do you have one man who was at the cross, and that was the, the um, Apostle John, the disciple John. So what we have here is a, something very strange. The disciples, after being with Christ for three years, didn't get it. And then when they find, when they see, when they meet the resurrected Christ here on the road to Emmaus, in other words, it's been three days since the crucifixion. They haven't seen him for three days. They were, they were with him for three years and they see him and they don't recognize him. And they basically think he's a stranger. And uh, he asks them, why are you guys sad? Why are you, you know, in this sort of uh, lackluster kind of mood? And they say, don't you know, stranger? Don't you know what happened in these days in Jerusalem? We were with this guy called Jesus Christ. And we thought that he was the Messiah. We thought that he would free us from the Romans. And then he ended up getting himself killed. And then some of our women went to the tomb and they found that the tomb was empty. And we don't know what on earth is happening. We're totally confused. So Christ then does what? He explains to them. He opens up the scripture. And he shows them in scripture that scripture is talking about the Christ. The scripture is talking about the fact that the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, had to suffer to enter into his glory. So when we say scripture, obviously we're talking about the Old Testament because that was scripture for Christ and that was scripture for the Jews. And there was no New Testament yet. And so Christ is opening up what we call the Old Testament, and he's showing them, he's opening up the meaning, he's unveiling it. In other words, it seems that when we just open up scripture, it's not enough. Because remember, St. Paul knew scriptures backwards and forwards, but it didn't do him any good because he was persecuting the Christians, right? In other words, he didn't get it from reading scriptures, from knowing scriptures so well that the scriptures are actually talking about Christ. So we need someone to unveil scripture. In other words, scripture is different from other books. Scripture is different from other literature. It's not simply a book about the history of the Jews a long, long, long time ago or something else. That's why we say that scripture is divinely inspired. There's more than meets the eye. It needs to be opened up by someone. It needs to be explained. And for us, it's explained to us by Christ. Christ is the one who opens the book for us and explains the true meaning so that it's not what you see is what you get. It's not obvious, the meaning. So you need it needs to be um, unveiled, okay? And this is exactly what Christ does on the road to Emmaus. He opens up the scriptures and shows them that it's actually talking about him. And it's actually talking about how the Son of Man, how the Messiah, how the Christ had to suffer in order to enter into his glory. And it says that as he was reading this, uh, their, 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 their heart was burning. In other words, they can understand, they understood that something was going on here that was something very, very, very special. Um, but they still didn't totally recognize him. They didn't understand that this is Christ, okay? So we have him opening up the scripture, and that's why Christ is usually portrayed with the book, and the book is basically the Old Testament, which is really talking about him. Read John 5, 46. It says, Moses spoke of me. When he says Moses, he means the Old Testament because it was believed back then that Moses wrote the whole Old Testament. Christ obviously was speaking according to what people thought and what they knew because just like St. Paul says, we need to be all things to all people. So, he opened up the book, and it says that their heart was burning within them. And then uh, what happened was he, as they went down the road, remember, it was evening, it says, and um, he was 
it says that he pretended to go further and the disciples kind of like constrained him. They tried to stop him and they said, why don't you stay with us tonight? And he ended up staying with them, right? And it says that he, they had a meal and at the breaking of the bread, at the breaking of the bread, it says that they recognized him, okay? So we have two things going on here. The opening of the book and then the breaking of the bread, okay? And basically what you have here is the story of what we actually do in church. And this is the basis and the kernel for our whole liturgical life and our whole, the whole liturgical year, okay? And you're going to see that this is connected with what we call the Paschal Mystery, which caused the whole liturgical year to unfold. So what do we have here? We have the opening up of the book and then the breaking of the bread. And at the breaking of the bread, it says that he disappeared. Why did he disappear? Because this is actually talking about what we do in liturgy. In other words, what we do in liturgy is a sense in which we're at no disadvantage for the passing of 2,000 years from, the, from Christ. It didn't do them any good that they saw him physically in front of them, right? They were with him for three years. They didn't recognize him. And even when they saw him resurrected, they still didn't recognize him until he opened up the scriptures and then broke the bread. This is exactly what we do in church. These are the two main parts of the divine liturgy, the so-called liturgy of the word, where we actually open up the book, right? We open up scripture and we try to explain it, okay? So we're explaining the scripture within the context of what? Within the context of the body of Christ. So Christ actually in the church is opening up the book for us. So we're doing the exact same thing that uh, was done uh, on the road to Emmaus. And then the second part of the divine liturgy is the liturgy of the sacrament, right? And that's where the, the main uh, sort of center of that part of the liturgy is uh, the manifestation of Christ in our midst as sacrament. So in the liturgy of the word, Christ is manifested in our midst as through his word, through scripture. And then in the second part, he's manifested to us through um, the sacrament. So here we have the whole liturgy right there. So the point I want to make here is that uh, we are at the road to Emmaus. In other words, in church, we get to see who Christ is. Our eyes are opened and we become the body of Christ. And becoming the body of Christ at the breaking of the bread, well, if we're his body, we can't see his body across from us. So he disappears, right? We become one with him. So we don't need to see him across from us. We are him. So that's actually what's happening in the divine liturgy. And just one thing I want to say is, remember I said that he opened up the book and the book is actually talking about him. It's not the way we oftentimes think of uh, the Old Testament as stuff that happened a long, long, long time ago, history of the Jews and so on, so on and so forth, leading up to Christ. It says that it's talking about Christ in cryptic language, in language that has to be unveiled. In other words, it's not enough to simply say, I am reading scripture, and we oftentimes read it the wrong way. We oftentimes read it not like scripture, but like a history book, or like this kind of book, or that kind of a book, okay? So it's special, it's divinely inspired, which means you need something more to understand it. So you have to be in the context of the body of Christ. It is opened up in church. And so in our church, the whole church is basically shaped by the opening of scripture, everything we do in church, all the iconography, all the hymnology, everything we smell, the incense, everything we do, all our movements, they're all trying to open up that book to uh, reveal to us the mystery of who Christ really is. And for this reason, there's a word called type. Type. What is type? Okay. The Greek word uh, type, typos, comes from the Greek verb, tipto. Tipto means I hit. So I'm just punching my hand, my left hand with my right fist. And what we have here is uh, really uh, the etymology for typos or type, like a typewriter. What do you have in a typewriter? You have uh, an imprint of a letter that you end up hitting it on 
uh, uh, ribbon with ink, and then you have the letter on the paper. What do you need first though? What is first? So let's explain it with this picture here. So you have the stamp and you have the wax. So you hit the stamp on the wax and then you have a perfect imprint. You have a type, okay? It's coming from the word tipto, the word that means I hit. So that's where this word type in English comes from. So scripture, Old Testament is a type of Christ, which means what do you need first? The stamp or the imprint? So sometimes we think that the imprint is first and that leads to the, the stamp, that the imprint is first and then that's why we, oftentimes we read scripture in the wrong way. This is the point I want to make, that you need the original first. So Christ is first and then you could talk about the type of Christ, which is scripture. Okay, so hopefully that will help us later on as we uh, move on and talking about this Paschal mystery. Okay, so opening up of the scripture and the breaking of the bread. Those are the two main things that we do in divine liturgy. And that's exactly what happened at the road to Emmaus. And through those actions, the disciples were finally able to figure out the mystery. In other words, it wasn't good enough to see Christ doing all those things that you expect the gods to do, right? Like Zeus over here. I mean, Zeus or you know, the ancient idea of how a god should be is all-powerful, throwing lightning bolts and so on and so forth. Well, Christ did all that stuff. He rose the dead. He healed the blind. He walked on the water. Was that good enough? No, because they didn't quite get it. Because they didn't really believe when they saw him crucified. So uh, the fact that he did those things that you expect gods to do, in other words, what I want to talk about here is what I want to try to communicate to you is how did Christ actually reveal to the disciples who God is? In other words, how did he reveal to them uh, God through being like a Zeus? Well, they didn't get it. And plus, if Christ, you know, can raise the dead and do all kinds of miracles and throw lightning bolts and be all those things that we think God should be, doesn't do us much good because, you know what, we can't do that. So Christ did all those things, but that's really not how he revealed to us who God is. Did he reveal to us who God is by being a first century Jew? Well, he was a first century Jew, but it seems that that's not good enough because that didn't make the disciples believe in him. And plus, I'm not a first century Jew. So if he reveals to the people who God is through being a godlike, it leaves people out because we're not godlike. If he reveals to the people, to us, who God is by being a first century Jew, that also leaves other people out because there are many people who are not first century Jews. If he reveals to everyone who God is by being poor, that also leaves people out because not everyone's poor. If he reveals, if he tries to reveal who God is by being rich, he also leaves people out, a lot of people out, right? Because not everyone's rich. So the point I want to make is that uh, Christ revealed to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and this is exactly what we're doing in church, and this is exactly what we're doing in our whole liturgical life, and this is exactly uh, the sort of kernel of the unfolding of the whole liturgical year, he didn't reveal who God is by any of these things that leave so many people out. He revealed who himself he revealed who he is and how he is God by what we all have in common. What's that? Death. No matter what, we're all going to die. So this is the one common element in human life. It's death. So he showed us what it is to be God, not by being a first century Jew, not by being rich, not by being poor, not by being like a Zeus, by throwing lightning bolts. He showed us what it is to be God 
by the way he died as a human being. So this is absolutely fantastic. He showed us what it is to be God by the way he died as a human being. And this is something that only a God of love could do. So this is fantastic. This is the starting point for everything. This is the starting point for church. This is the starting point for our liturgical life. This is the starting point for all theology. In other words, this is the, without this, we can't really talk about anything. So that's why I wanted to start this class by uh, stressing this, that only the only way for a God of love to show us who God is, is through death. Why? Because it's the ultimate indication of love. In ancient Greek mythology, there's um, Odysseus, you know, the Odyssey. You probably know that um, there was a, a god called Calypso who was in love with him, and she wanted to marry him. And she said to him, look, if you marry me, you're going to become a god, and you're not going to have all those problems that human beings have, all the pain, all the limitation, all the trials and tribulations, all the limitations. If he chose that, you know what? There would be no hero. It would be the end of the Odyssey. There will be no journey. Because if you end up becoming an unlimited God, what is there even to do? You can't even be a hero. You can't even show love, right? Because there's no challenge, you might say. So Odyssea, Odysseus preferred to go back to his wife, Penelope. And that's the Odyssey. And that whole adventure of going back home to Penelope is why we still read the Odyssey. So if this is the case for Greek mythology, and we see uh, Odysseus as a hero because he decided to go, he preferred to go to his, to his mortal life, his mortal wife, rather than be, being a god, which would end the whole story and end the whole journey, and there would be no challenge and there will be no way of showing his love and the no way of showing his heroism then uh you know the whole story would end so if this is the case for odysseus where he preferred going back to the world of challenge and pain and limitation in order to be with his mortal wife wife penelope and this impresses us how much more would the God of love do for us? So he goes to the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice for his Penelope, the ultimate sacrifice for his bride, the church, and that is crucifixion. So the only way he could show who God is, if God is really a God of love, is through the crucifixion. So this is really uh, the Paschal mystery, and this is the starting point for everything. So... Um, Having said that, we need to really stress that uh, what we have here is okay. Let me just go back and I want to show you this. Okay. Uh, what this means is what we read about in scripture, um, that God's power is made perfect in weakness. And we need to really stress another thing that we read in the gospels, and that's from Matthew 16. Do you remember what happened in Matthew 16? That's where um, Christ asked the disciples, who do people say I am? And the disciples told him, well, some people say that you might be St. John the Baptist resurrected, or you might be Elijah, and so on and so forth. But who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. And uh, Christ said to him, well, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. 
but the Father. Why? Because remember what we said before, having Christ in front of you, whatever he was, five foot nine, uh, brown hair, brown eyes, whatever he was, that didn't do them good. In other words, it wasn't good enough because remember, they didn't get it, right? So just seeing him physically in front of them is not good enough. You need to see him sacramentally. You need the opening of the book and the uh, breaking of the bread, right? In other words, we are at no disadvantage, you know, after 2,000 years. In other words, we're at the same place where they were at the road to Emmaus when their eyes were finally opened. So um, in Matthew 16, that's why Christ says to Peter that, you know, it's not flesh and blood. It's not just you seeing me physically, because that's not good enough, because that causes problems, as we, we saw. Um, so it's not flesh and blood, but the, the, it's through the Father that you actually know who I am, okay? And then Christ continues and says that, well, you know what's going to happen afterwards? The authorities are going to, you know, arrest me, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, tried, and they're going to uh, sentence me to death, crucify me, I'm going to die, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And basically, Peter said, over my dead body, that can't ever happen to you. And what did Christ say? He said to um, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, he didn't say, you know what? Don't listen to Satan. You know what? Satan is influencing you. Be careful. He called him Satan. Why? Who is Satan? Satan is whoever gets between Christ and the cross. So why is this important? Because you cannot take Christ apart from the cross. The only way uh, Christ showed us who God is by the way he died as a human being. The only way he showed us who God is, the only way he revealed to us God is not by being doing godly things. That wasn't good enough for us, right? We didn't get it. But the only way he showed us who God is was through the crucifixion. So we cannot, uh, you know, understand God uh, other uh, apart from the crucifixion, otherwise we play the role of Satan. Okay, so what you have here is so this is the only way that God is revealed to us. It's a singular mystery. It's not like this is something of a, an accident. In other words, that because of the fall, Christ came. Because that would make Christ plan B. In other words, the whole story of salvation is the one plan of God. It's not uh, a mistake, the fall, followed by a rescue mission. Rather, this is the one plan of God from the beginning. And that's why you read in Scripture that Christ is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? So from the foundation of the world, before there are even human beings, you might say. So this is the one plan, and the death and resurrection is inscribed into it. So this is uh, the one plan of salvation, and this is the foundation, the Paschal mystery for everything we do in church. Okay, now let me explain to you what the human being is. What is the human project? In other words, what does it mean to become a human being? Well, obviously, to become a human being is to be like Christ. But let me explain it better. What do you have in Genesis? It says in Genesis 1 that, um, you know, let us make the human being in our image and likeness. And then it says that we make the human being in our image and likeness, male and female, we make them, right? So first of all, it's in the singular, the human being, okay? Because in, in Greek, I mean, in English, it's, it's translated wrong, where it says, let us make man in our image and likeness. It doesn't say that. It says, let, let's, let us make the anthropos. Let us make the human being in our image and likeness. And then later on, it talks about man and woman. First, it talks about the human being. And so, the whole point in Genesis is that God wants to make a human being. 
but we're in the process of being made. Let us make the human being means that we're still in the process of being made. And it turns out that if you look through in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is um, connecting with Genesis and on purpose playing with Genesis. And you know how Genesis begins with in the beginning? Well, look at uh, the Gospel of John. It also begins in the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning. So it's on purpose trying to imitate Genesis in order to, to show that that project that begins in, the, in Genesis is what? Is completed in Christ. But before I say that, let me just say one more thing about Genesis. Throughout Genesis, it says, you know, God created, you know, the earth. God created the sky. God created the sea. So every one of these things, it says that God had a command, let it be, you know, so be it, it is good, done. So with a word of a command, everything was created, uh, and then it was good. The one thing that is done differently, where it's not let it be, or so be it, it is good, is the human being. In the case of the human being, it says, let us make. So it seems as if Everything in Genesis is kind of like a backdrop where all these things are made from the very beginning as a sort of done deal, you know, the earth, the sky, the moon, and so on and so forth. Everything is made, okay, through a command of God, whereas when it comes to the human being, different uh, sort of form is used where it says, let us make. In other words, there's a project. It's not a done deal. And it turns out that John, the Gospel of John, continues this story and basically shows us how this project is finally, uh, finally comes to a conclusion. In other words, how we finally get the human being. Human being is not a done deal. A human being is something that's in the is 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 uh, in a process. So what you have is John uh, basically shows us what the human being is. The human being is someone who lays his life for the other. So in John, uh, you have Pilate saying, behold the human being. In English, it's a bad translation. It says, behold the man. So when Christ is on his way to the cross, that's where you have the sort of conclusion of this project that begins at Genesis. Let us make the human being in our image and likeness, but there's no real human being. Because the only way for us to become a human being is to be like Christ. And what is Christ doing when he's called the human being? Behold the human being. He's on his way to the cross. And then only in John, on the cross, Christ says the word teteleste, which which doesn't mean it is finished, I'm dead. But it really means in Greek, because some of you who know Greek might know that the word uh, telos means finish or end but also there's another word derived from the same uh, root which is telios which means perfect so the teleste in the gospel of john really means it is fulfilled it is perfected perfected what is fulfilled what is perfected that project this is the human being this is the way to become a human being through laying your life for the other in other words through the cross so the only way for someone to become a human being is to voluntarily lay his life for the other, like Christ. So can you really make a human being? Can God make a human being? No, because we have to give the whole K. So for everything else that God created, basically uh, there's a so be it, and whatever God creates is created, and it is good. But in the case of the human being, we have to give the amen. We have to give the let it be. So Christ says in the Old Testament where God is creating, he says, let it be, it is good. Let it be, let it be, let it be, whatever. All these different things that he creates, but only with the human being, he doesn't say let it be because the human being has to give the answer. And that answer is this whole process of becoming human. So the human project really has to do with what? Us laying our life for the other, us becoming like Christ. And another way of describing this is to say that the process that we are going through as we become a human being is we begin with breath, 
In other words, we need to use our breath, the life given to us, in order to lay our life for the other. And breath, by definition, is transitory, is temporary. Um, and that's why we read in the gospel that who, whoever uh, tries to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. In other words, whoever loses his, whoever uses his breath, whoever uses the life, the temporary life given, in other words, because breath is by definition temporary, right? You need to keep on breathing. You need to keep on grabbing more and more and more. You can't just hold your breath, right? You'll die. Um, so what we have is through the breath, uh, if we use our breath to die to ourselves, uh, then we become human. Okay, so that's a necessary first step. Okay, so having said all this, let us um, again look at what we have in, in Scripture. Then God formed Anthropos out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his face the breath of life. That's the first step. And then in Romans um, chapter 5, St. Paul says that Adam is a type of the one to come. And now you know what type means, right? From the word tipto, I hit, okay? So uh, Adam is simply a type, a sketch, a preliminary sketch of the real one who is to come, who is Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man became a, a life-giving spirit. So we use our breath to become um, spirit-filled. So that's the whole process of becoming human. Okay. Let's move on to how liturgy was done in the ancient church. And this will help us understand how this Paschal mystery was sort of like the starting point for liturgy and then for everything else that we do throughout the year. Okay, so what do we have? Really, the purpose of liturgy is exactly what we saw on the road to Emmaus. And the liturgy is composed of two parts. The first part is the opening up of the book, the liturgy of the word, right? In the context of Christ, in other words, Christ, the church is the body of Christ. So Christ is opening up, up, open up, opening up the scripture for us and explaining it for us. In other words, because it's cryptic, it's veiled. He has to uh, unveil it for us, right? It's mysterious. It's not like any other book. That's why it's divinely inspired, okay? It's not what you see is what you get. It's not simply talking about the history of, you know, what people did 10,000 years ago, because if that was the case, then you might as well go to the library and get a paleontology book, right? Or an archaeology book. It's not archaeology. It's not paleontology. It's divinely inspired. It's a type of Christ. It's talking about Christ. So part one, Liturgy of the Word, Part Two, the Liturgy of the Faithful. So, it turns out that the church is actually a matrix. This is a diagram of Hagia Sophia, the great church of Saint Sophia in Constantinople, which is basically where the Byzantine rite uh, was forged, where it was created, where it evolved, where it developed. Okay, and the interesting thing about this is that. If you look at it, this is, we're looking at it from above. What you have here is a place called the atrium, which is an open courtyard where all the people would gather, okay, when they're about to do liturgy. And then we're going to see how they all would enter through all the different doors because there'd be many, many, many people, okay? They would all enter, okay? And the important thing about the structure of this church is that it's long and it caters to processions. The whole point is that we're processing towards God, okay? So we'll talk about other details uh, as, as we go, go on, okay? But the important thing about the church is that what you have in Hagia Sophia is kind of like the combination of a basilica. What's a basilica? It's a long building, like this basilica in Ravenna, Italy, where basically what you have is uh, a building that can fit a lot of people and also it caters for it it, it actually is um appropriate let's say for uh, great entrances for entrances of all the people which means something physically that we're going to god but also not only is Hagia Sophia long okay and in other words building that it caters to uh, processions but also it's also centralized okay 
So the sense in which what you have is almost like a big sort of like, it looks like a square here, but it's a centralized building because if you could think of the, of the, the, the dome that's on top, it's, there's this idea of also the circle, okay? And so that is, the circle reminds us of what? A womb, that the church is actually a womb. The church is the place where we're being formed. The church is the place where the book is opened and also where um, we break the bread and we become Christ. So in this church setting, we are becoming human, okay? So the word matrix is a Latin word that actually means womb. So you can say that the church is the matrix. It's our matrix. It's the womb forming us, giving birth to us. And the only way that we can, that this birth can happen is, like you said, like we said before, through the passion. In other words, you cannot take Christ apart from the passion. You cannot take Christ apart from the cross. So it's always the resurrected. So it's always the, the, the crucified and resurrected one that is revealed to us. And that's what what is revealed to us in church. Okay, so that's the Paschal mystery. Okay, now, how does it work? Okay, so... Um, again, here's another diagram of Hagia Sophia. In the very beginning, in the ancient liturgy, what we call today the small entrance would have been a huge entrance. In other words, it was not small, and it was not done only by the clergy. It was not like a U-turn of the clergy going from the altar back into the altar. The original small entrance, the original beginning of the divine liturgy was all the people entering into the church, okay? So that was the entrance of all the people. So we have all the people gathering in a place like this atrium in this ancient church in a, on an island, uh, Torcello Island near Venice. Uh, this shows you the way the ancient um, Byzantine churches used to be, where the people would gather in this kind of a courtyard, and then they would all... Um, the bishop there would be there, and sometimes the patriarch and the bishop. And here's another atrium, okay? You could see it's an open courtyard where the people would gather before they would actually enter the, into church. And then they would enter into the narthex. And here in Hagia Sophia, there's this big door, okay? And this is called the royal gates. So the royal gates were not what we now call the royal gates, wrongly. In other words, at the iconostas, you know, the gates into the sanctuary or the gates into the altar area of the church, the original royal gates was the huge door in the narthex where patriarch and emperor would enter. And that's why they're called the royal gates. So we do today in our small entrance where the priest, um, you know, the deacon tells the priest to bless the entrance. Well, that was done here in the narthex together with all the people. So all the people would enter, and this would be how, and the, the, the blessing of the entrance would be the entrance, literally, of all the people, okay? So, and here's another diagram of the way the church would look inside, a typical Byzantine church. Um, as people would walk in, you'd find that the clergy would go into, would, they would go straight into the altar, and all the way into the back, and at the back, there would be this throne called the Synthronon. Okay. Before we go to the Synthronon, we need to look at something before that, and that's this thing in the middle of the church. What's this? This is called the Ambon. Why is the Ambon important? The Ambon was the, the pulpit, and it was huge, and it was right in the middle of the church. Why? This is where, this is the center of the first part of the liturgy. In other words, the so-called liturgy of the word, where, as we saw in the road to Emmaus, the book was opened, the scripture was opened, and we need that. That's the first step where our heart begins to burn, and we begin to get closer and closer to recognizing who Christ really is, because, of course, of course the second part is the breaking of the bread, which happens here in the altar, where, at this point, our eyes are opened, and we actually know who Christ is. So um, the first part, though, the scriptures are read in the very middle of the church. Why? Because this emphasizes to the people all around that this is 
uh, Christ in our midst being manifested to us in our midst through the opening of scripture, just like on the road to Emmaus. Okay, so the ambon was in a central position, just like the altar was in a position that was sort of like sticking out. It wasn't the way it is now where everything is kind of like all brought all the way back to the east and far away from the people. Everything was more in a, a, in a more accessible sort of like form, put it this way. Okay, so the ambon. So this is George the Foolish is here. And I want you all to know that uh, this is near George the Foolish's um, village. So this is a place called Kalabaka. This is the church of the Kimisis. And it's the only church in Greece where there still is an amvon in the middle of the church standing. All the other churches at, at some point, we forgot about the amvon and forgot about the importance of reading the scripture in the midst of the people. Okay. So his wife, Liana, took this picture last summer. So thank you very much, Liana. Thank you very much, George, for allowing Liana to, to uh, travel through Greece. And she actually uh, had to, you know, it took a lot of effort to make this picture because usually this church is closed. And it turned out that there was a baptism on that day. And so she was able to get into the church and she took this beautiful pic picture. So this is the only standing amvon in any church in Greece, strangely enough, even though this was something that was universal. It was a, a feature in all churches in Byzantine times. And when I say Byzantine times, I'm actually talking about the time before iconoclasm. So we're talking from the fourth to the sixth or seventh century, you would have this. And some churches would have, would have it also afterwards. But anyway, we, we don't want to get into too many details uh, in, in this first lecture. Okay, so we have the Ambon. Okay, and here's another Ambon. Uh, that was uh, found at, um, in a church of um, the um, uh, basilica, the first basilica of the Bayazit um, church found in Constantinople. In any case, this is um, in a courtyard now, in the courtyard of Hagia Sophia, and this shows you the way an ambon would have looked like. The ambon in Hagia Sophia actually would be much bigger. In any case, um, so let me just show you what... Um, It would look like if you were to um, go into uh, a year Sophia. So this is a year Sophia. Um, this is the courtyard. Inside the church. Okay, this is the diagram I showed you before. And the people would enter through here and they go around the ambo, the ambon, okay, that central uh, piece of liturgical furniture from which the gospels would be read. But let's not waste time and go further. What I wanna show you is this. That what you have is I want to show you the ambon. We're getting there, I think. Sorry. There it is. This, uh, the ambon was in a huge ambon in the center of the church. And this is from this point, the gospel and the scripture would be uh, read of uh, the epistle and the, and the, and the, um, the gospel. Okay. Uh, and actually when the clergy would come in, remember they would bless the entrance at the narthex they would all come in with all the people so it was an entrance of all the people and clergy and laity right and they would but the clergy would go in here in this in, in into this sort of like the area 
and not go up the stairs, but they would go around and then they would go into So this imagery is this imagery is not totally accurate. Um, okay, the important thing. So there would be no curtains in those days, but after the ambon, the clergy would would enter into the sanctuary area. So this is the sanctuary area, and you see that actually there would no, there would be no curtains. This is wrong. No curtains, it would be totally open, and they would enter here, and they would go all the way around the altar table, and they go up the stairs, and this thing here is called the synthronon, okay? And the bishop would sit on the, this top throne. This is where his throne used to be in the ancient church. Why is this? Because this was an image of the eschaton. This was an image of the end times. It's an image of what we're really doing in liturgy. In divine liturgy, we are actually in total communion with the Christ of the end times, with the kingdom. In other words, the foretaste of the kingdom. That's the whole purpose of liturgy. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's continue. All right, we just saw in that cartoon, the synthronon, the synthronon was at the back of the altar and that's where uh, all the, the clergy, in other words, the bishop would be in the middle, okay? In the middle and then on the other side, there would be the presbyters, the priests and the deacons and then all the people would be around, okay? So what you have here was really an image of the kingdom. So that's really what we're doing in liturgy. Okay, so that's the liturgy of the word, okay? That, in other words, the um, people would come in and go all the way up. They would gather at this synthronon, okay? The clergy would be in the sanctuary area in the back, and they would all sit down in order to listen to the scripture that was going to be read from the ambon in the middle of the church, okay? So that basically was the liturgy of the word. After the reading of the scriptures, there would be petitions, okay? And that's the way it was in the ancient church because that's the proper protocol, right? You allow God to speak first and then you speak back, okay? I mean, just proper protocol. In today's liturgy, we basically begin by asking God for stuff, right? We begin with the petitions. So that's a later development and it's not really, let's say, uh, as proper or as you know, it's not proper protocol, put it this way. Okay, so let's move on. Liturgy of the Faithful. In the Liturgy of the Faithful, the main sort of uh, purpose of it is for Christ to be manifested to us um, through the breaking of the bread. So we can become his body, and then once we become his body, it's not like we're seeing him somewhere else, uh, right? But we become him, okay? And so I don't want to bore you with all kinds of different um, terminologies, but Basically, the liturgy of the faithful, the part two, right, where which co concentrates on the sacrament, concentrates on the Eucharistic prayer, on the anaphora, as it were, um, it begins with the great entrance. So we have the great entrance, and the great entrance actually was what? There was a building outside uh, Hagia Sophia and outside all of these churches um, in the sort of like heyday of the, Byzant of the Byzantine rite, that is to say from the fourth century to the sixth century, at least, if not afterwards or also, there was a building called the Scevophilacum. It was a separate building. And this is where all the stuff that was needed for the celebration of the liturgy would be stored. It was a vestry, all the, the vestments, but also all the bread and wine would be offered. In other words, the people would actually offer. That's why uh, the bread that we use for, the Eucharist today is called prosphoro. Prosphoro means offering. Okay, so these things, these the, the bread and wine would actually be brought to the church by the people and left at this vestry. And this is where the deacons would actually 
the Jews the best bread and the best wine. And when it was time for the part two, for the liturgy of the faithful, when, you know, you, you would need the stuff in order to, you know, to manifest Christ at, through the sacrament, uh, the actual, what we call the great entrance today, which today is actually a U-turn, right? It actually would be a real entrance from a separate building, from this Skevophilakion. Okay, so... Um, Okay, let's go back to the structure of this part two, the liturgy of the faithful. Okay, we have the great entrance where the gifts are brought by the deacons. In the ancient church, it would, they would be only given, only brought in by the deacons. In fact, this is simply a practical entrance where the deacons would bring in all the things that were needed for the uh, celebration of the divine liturgy. They would bring in whatever utensils were used and also the bread and the wine and so on and so forth, okay? And this would lead to the Eucharistic prayer, the anaphora, which actually is broken up into these parts, okay? So I don't wanna make things too complicated, but basically there is a doxology and thanksgiving and anamnesis, which means a remembering of all the great things that God did for us. The words of institution where you know, we say, take, eat, this is my body, and so on and so forth, which are actually um, taken from the Last Supper, right? That's why they're called the words of institution, in the sense that those words institute the Eucharist. And then the elevation of the gifts, which normally the deacons do, we'll talk about this later, uh, the epiclesis, which is to say, the calling down of the Holy Spirit, the diptychs, where um, the names of the people would be mentioned, in other words, all these things would be done publicly in the ancient church. And then you would actually have the communion followed by the Lord's Prayer. And then um, the, well, well the, the, I mean the communion, sorry, the communion part, okay? The Lord's Prayer, the fraction, the breaking up of the, uh, the lamb, and then the communion of the clergy and the communion, communion of the laity, okay? Okay, so what you have is basically in... Uh, this second part of the divine liturgy, um, the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, but that's the breaking of the bread where we actually all become the uh, body of Christ. And so what you have here is unity with God. So the whole purpose of the divine liturgy, the whole purpose of our liturgical life, and you're going to see that the whole purpose of the whole liturgical cycle, it really starts from this idea that what we're doing in the divine liturgy is it's a marriage of heaven and earth. And that's why in the Orthodox churches, we have domes, right? So the dome is important. This is the dome of Hagia Sophia. It looks as if the sky is falling on your head. Why? Because the whole point that we read about in scripture is what's the point of human life? Well, we said becoming human means we lay our life for the other. We become Christ-like and so on and so forth. So the real purpose is, you might say, the marriage of heaven and earth. In other words, unity with God. That's where we become truly living, right? Because we're limited, we're circumscribed, we're created, we're not infinite, we're finite. Um, so the only way for the finite to become infinite, the only way for the dead to become living is to uh, join uh, the unlimited. Okay, so that's exactly what we're having in church. So the whole purpose of life that we read about in scriptures is not, you know, saving your soul and going to heaven. It's not about going somewhere else and escaping this world. It's about transforming this world and waiting for Christ to come back. Scripture doesn't end with us going to heaven. Scripture ends with the second coming, okay? And at ascension, when the disciples saw Christ being ascended, the angel said, what are you looking at that for? In the same way that you saw him ascending, he's going to descend again. So we're waiting for the second coming. And that's why the architecture of our church, our Byzantine churches especially, has this kind of structure where it looks as if the sky is going to fall on your, on your head. And in our churches, normally we have a 
Pandocrator up here, an icon of Christ. It, that's really emphasizing that Christ is coming again. And that's the whole purpose of church. It's the whole purpose of human life, waiting for that final transformation. Okay, and so we're put into this narrative through the way the church is constructed. Okay, so the whole purpose of the liturgy is for us to become citizens of the kingdom. And through the prayers, hymnology, and iconography, we are being formed. It's the womb that gradually transforms us into human beings. We're not automatically human beings. You know, being a human being really depends on how you define it. So according to scripture, the human being is defined the way we said before in the Gospel of John, that the human being is Christ on his way to the cross. Behold the human being. And that human project is only um, consummated, only completed on the cross. Teteleste. It is perfected. It is fulfilled. Okay, so that's actually what's happening to us in church. We're also becoming human. We're also learning how to lay our life for the other and become truly human. Okay, so you might say that our life in church and our whole liturgical life and the whole liturgical cycle that we're going to be talking about in this class, it's a big holy Saturday. What do I mean? Holy Saturday is that day where you might say um, that this whole plan finally became a reality. What do I mean? Holy Saturday is all about making the human being. Holy Saturday was the day when Christ was in the grave. In other words, the lowest point. In other words, dead in the grave. And it turns out, if you read in Scripture, that the whole purpose of the Sabbath is to create the human being. The only way we can be created is at, through, that, through that ultimate sacrifice of the cross. And this is really what's being taught to us, and this is really what, how we're being formed in church. What am I talking about? I'm talking about, if you read in um, John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 5. You might remember that's where Christ um, healed the paralytic, and it was on a Sabbath. And you might say, why did Christ keep on healing on a Sabbath? I mean, he, it, it, it was almost as if he was, um, how do you say, blowing up his whole plan, right? Because there was so much commotion, and he had so many problems because of all the uh, uh, issues that, that ensued every time he healed on the Sabbath. So in John 5, it was a Sabbath and he healed the paralytic. And everyone made a big deal about this because for the Jews, it was as if he was not respecting the Sabbath because they thought that the Sabbath meant, well, we simply don't do anything. We simply rest. Why? Because they're not reading scripture the right way. They're not reading scripture as a type. That everything in the Old Testament is talking about Christ. What you read about in Genesis about the Sabbath rest, that's the type. It's not the original. It's pointing to the religion. It's a sketch. It's pointing to what really happened in Christ. What am I talking about? The Sabbath rest, we read about it in Holy Saturday in the hymn that talks about... Um, what the real Sabbath is. The real Sabbath is Holy Saturday. The great Moses mystically foreshadowed this day saying, and God blessed the seventh day. This is the blessed Sabbath, meaning Holy Saturday. Not what, what you read in Genesis. That's the type, okay? The reality is Christ, we said. Remember the fist and the wax, or remember the stamp and the wax, Okay. You need the original. You need the stamp first. The stamp is Christ. But what is stamped, that's the type. And that's not the original. That's the sketch coming from the original. So the great Moses mystically foreshadowed this day saying, and God blessed the seventh day. This is the blessed Sabbath, Holy Saturday. This is the day of rest. And on it, the only begotten son of God rested from all his works. So it's not like the Holy Saturday is an imitation of what, of what happened back then, but rather that's an imitation of the reality, which is 
the Holy Saturday. Okay, so in John 5, where Christ healed the paralytic on uh, a Sabbath, there was a great commotion that followed after he healed him because the Jews said that, you know, you're not supposed to work on a Sabbath and so on and so forth, which means they misunderstood this whole idea of Sabbath rest. What is the Sabbath rest? The Sabbath rest that, 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 that's, ref that's referred to in the Old Testament is really talking about the Sabbath rest of Christ in the tomb, okay? Which is not something that's idle, but that's the real work of making the human being. So when, John, when Christ healed the paralytic in John chapter 5, um, after all the commotion, what did Christ say? He said, my father is still working, and so am I. In other words, there's a certain work that we do on the Sabbath. And what is that work? It's the creating of the human being. It's making of the human being, okay? And then in John 9, where Christ heals the blind man, the same thing happens. He heals the blind man on a Sabbath. And the interesting thing is that what the way he does it is he doesn't simply, you know, make an order, be healed, but he actually spits on the ground and makes mud and puts that in the eyes of the blind man. What does that remind you of? It reminds you of the... The, the dust or the mud of the forming of the human being in Genesis, okay? So that what we read about in Genesis is actually a type, okay? It's a sketch of the real thing, which is Christ forming us uh, on the real sab Sabbath, which is the Holy Saturday. So what does Christ say? Um, when the disciples see the blind man and say, they ask, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And he said, neither this man nor his parents. The reason that he was born blind is so that the work of God may be made manifest. That the work of God may be made manifest. What is the work of God? Creating the human being. Okay. So we find that Here's the, the paralytic being healed on the Sabbath. And here's the blind man being healed on the Sabbath. So the actual work of the Sabbath is the work of Holy Saturday when Christ is in the tomb and the human being is made at the weakest point. Only in laying our life for the other, God's strength is made perfect in weakness, and the utmost weakness is death. So Christ showed to us who God is by the way he died as a human being. In no other way did he show us who God is. So the purpose of the Sabbath is to make the human being. And that's actually what's happening in church. Church is one big Sabbath. And we're being formed as human beings. So through the liturgical life, through liturgy, and through the whole liturgical cycle, this mystery is unfolded. So it all begins with the Paschal mystery. And as Christ says in John 21, the purpose is to raise the dead and give them life. And in Isaiah, who was a prophet who wrote about Christ 700 years before Christ was born, uh, he already predicts all about the passion. So this is really what we're going to be talking about in this class. I'm sorry if this class, this first one was a bit choppy. Um, it's just because of um, exhaustion of these days. I'm not going to make excuses for that, but hopefully uh, as we go on, you'll understand We'll understand more and more and we'll understand how this first step talking about the Paschal mystery is extremely important um, for the rest of the class. So I think that's enough for the first day. Uh, I'm going to post a question for you to answer and we'll be um, seeing each other in a live session and we'll get to um, elaborate upon what we talked about. So God bless you all. I look forward to seeing you. I look forward to working with you all throughout the week. God bless you.